Father, you have given me your words for this time. I ask that you guide my speech, guide my mind in a way that would deliver your truth to those who are ready to receive it. In Jesus' name. Well, as I mentioned, there are prophetic books in the Bible that speak of Christ's return. Hallelujah. And there are even books of prophecy that talk about what happens after that. God's church, the body of Christ, will rule and reign on this earth for a thousand years after his return. Amen, right? I'm trying to get someone fired up. This is not the end, you know. All right. By way of introduction, I'd like to read that uh, passage from Zechariah. And, oh, man, this this prophetic word will stir your spirit. I, I know it. Zechariah chapter 14, verse 1, it says, Watch, for the day of the Lord is coming when your possessions will be plundered right in front of you. Half the population will be taken into captivity and the rest will be left among the ruins of the city. Then the Lord will go out and fight against those nations as he has fought in times past. On that day, his feet will stand on the Mount of Olives, east of Jerusalem. And the Mount of Olives will split apart, making a wide valley running east to west. Half the mountain will be moved toward the north and half toward the south. You will flee through this valley, for it will reach across Azal. Yes, you will flee as you did from the earthquake in the days of King Uzziah of Judah. Then the Lord, my God, will come and all his holy ones with him. That's us. On that day, the sources of light will no longer shine, yet there will be continuous day. Only the Lord knows how this could happen. There will be no normal day. There will be no normal night, but it will still be light. Verse 8, on that day, life-giving waters will flow out of Jerusalem, half toward the Dead Sea and half toward the Mediterranean, flowing continuously in both summer and winter. And the Lord will be king over all the earth. On that day, there will be one Lord. His name alone will be worshipped. Hallelujah. That will be the day. Christ's reign on earth. Every knee will bow. As we sang last Sunday, Jesus is coming back. And prophecy says that after his return, as we just read, his church will reign with him for a thousand years. This message God gave me for today originated from a study on John chapter 7. I was so intrigued by the Jewish festival of tabernacles, also referred to as uh, tabernacles or tents or booths, but it's John chapter seven. But I was so intrigued with all the research, you can ask Charles, I'd come over and be like, oh, did you know that they, oh, did you hear about it? Just like, oh, did you know that they used to do this? Just so excited. I was like, oh my gosh, there's so much significance in the tradition of all of the Jewish festivals. And I learned a lot, but I, I promise I won't go into too much detail about the research because I didn't know that I was preaching this Sunday before um, I had started this research. So it was just a study that I was doing. But all of the Jewish festivals have deep rooted meaning with ceremonies that are performed to this very day. In fact, the one that we're talking about, the time for this this year is October. So this is a fall festival of sorts. But the rituals that were and are still extremely sacred and precious to the Jewish people. Now, you look there on your handout, uh, the Leviticus scripture, as well as the Deuteronomy scripture, uh, Leviticus 23 and Deuteronomy 16. From generation to generation, this was a tradition not just passed down from family to family, generation to generation, this was a command from God himself. This was not just a ritual that they said, 
you know what? It's nice. I think we should give back God all the praise for this past harvest season. It was a command on your handout. There you'll find it from God to give him glory for what he had done in the past season and to be expecting for what he would do in the next season. And I think we could all learn a little bit from that. Be expecting that God is still doing something. Ever since the command was given to Moses. So as I mentioned, the one we're going to look at is the festival of shelters in John chapter 7. This festival was the big celebration. The biggest celebration the entire year. Now imagine if we as a church would do anything like this, like if, if the Christian culture all across Pennsylvania would just gather together and on one day say, all right, no denominational differences. We're going to get together at a stadium or an arena, and we are going to praise God for all he has done and all he will do. But the joy from that doesn't stop there. We could come together and just be joyful that this isn't it. He's coming back for us. And that is praiseworthy in and of itself. Every single Bible-believing Jesus follower could just come together. But there's nothing like this festival in the Christian tradition. But (laughs) we may be starting something here today celebrating the joyful occasion of Christ's return. If there was a movement that started just about his glorious return, and once a year we gathered as believers just to be joyful for that. I mean, can you really wrap your head around 100,000 people in a stadium praising God, singing your favorite hymn, And giving God all of the glory. Just close your eyes and picture it. We are singing the the praises of God. Your favorite hymn. And then, in an instant. In an instant. Glorified bodies. Christ's return. The blast of the trumpet. Together forever. Eternity to begin. Reunited with the loved one that loved Jesus. Start rejoicing about reuniting with the ones that have gone before us. After all, that's why we do what we do, right? It doesn't just stop here. This isn't all we have. Well, if you close your eyes and you pictured 100,000 people, it might have not been 100,000, but that's exactly what the atmosphere was like at the Festival of Shelters in John chapter 7. Jewish people from all over came together to celebrate and be joyful. They're on your handout. They were required to be joyful. God commanded them to be joyful, to get together and be joyful. Not just a tradition, a command for the Jewish people by God himself. Now, the rituals were far greater than any tradition, but... The, re- the priest had a responsibility. All throughout Leviticus and Deuteronomy, these are the lists of the priest's duties during these festivals. And out of obedience, the people would come. The festival of shelters, the festival of tabernacles, the one that we're going to look at today is the third of three and the seventh of seven. All right, I'm the only one that likes numbers. The third of three, Trinity. The seventh of seven, completion. Deuteronomy 16, 15 says, this festival will be a time of great joy for all. So now that we've set the scene for John chapter seven, I'm gonna read it. John chapter seven, verse one. Jesus traveled around Galilee. He wanted to stay out of Judea where the Jewish leaders were plotting his death. I would too. But soon it was time for the Jewish festival of shelters. And Jesus' brothers said to him, leave here and go to Judea, where your followers can see your miracles. You can't become famous if you hide like this. 
If you can do such wonderful things, show yourself to the world. For even his brothers didn't believe in him. Jesus replied, now is not the time for me to go, but you can go anytime. The world can't hate, can't hate you. The world can't hate you, but it does hate me because I accuse it of doing evil. You go on. I'm not going to this festival because my time has not yet come. After saying these things, Jesus remained in Galilee. But after his brothers left for the festival, Jesus also went, though secretly, staying out of public view. The Jewish leaders tried to find him at the festival and kept asking if anyone had seen him. There was a lot of grumbling about him among the crowds. Some argued, he's a good man, but others said, he's nothing but a fraud who deceives the people. But no one had the courage to speak favorably about him in public, for they were afraid of getting in trouble with the Jewish leaders. Then, midway through the festival, Jesus went up to the temple and began to teach. <laughs> he can do whatever he wants. The people were surprised when they heard him. How does he know so much when he hasn't yet been trained? So Jesus told them, my message is not my own. It comes from God who sent me. Anyone who wants to do, let me read that again. Anyone who wants to do the will of God will know whether my teaching is from God or is merely my own. Those who speak for themselves want glory only for themselves. But a person who seeks to honor the one who sent him speaks truth, not lies. Moses gave you the law, but none of you obeys it. In fact, you're trying to kill me. The crowd replied, you're demon possessed. Who's trying to kill you? Verse 25. Some of the people who lived in Jerusalem started to ask each other, isn't this the man they're trying to kill? But here he is speaking in public and they can say nothing about him. Could our leaders possibly believe that he is the Messiah? But how could he be? For we know where this man comes from. When the Messiah comes, he will simply appear. No one will know where he comes from. While Jesus was teaching in the temple, he called out, yes, you know me and where I come from, but I'm not here on my own. The one who sent me is true and you don't know him, but I know him because I come from him and he sent me to you. Then the leaders tried to arrest him, but no one laid a hand on him because he's Jesus. I mean, uh, because his time had not yet come. Many among the crowds at the temple believed in him. After all, they said, would you expect the Messiah to do more miraculous signs than this man has done? When the Pharisees heard that, these, that the crowds were whispering such things, they and the leading priests sent temple guards to arrest Jesus. But Jesus told them, I will be with you only a little longer. Then I will return to the one who sent me. You will search for me, but not find me. And you cannot go where, where I am going. Verse 37. On the last day, the climax of the fast, <coughs> excuse me. On the last day, the climax of the festival, Jesus stood and shouted to the crowds, anyone who is thirsty may come to me. Anyone who believes in me may come and drink. For the scriptures declare rivers of living water will flow from his heart. When he said living water, he was speaking of the spirit who would be given to everyone believing in him. But the spirit had not yet been given because Jesus had not yet entered into his glory. God does not hide from his children his message. Verse 39 clearly states that Jesus is referring to the Holy Spirit. <laughs> John clearly states in, in 39, living water is the Holy Spirit. Yeah. Period. Because John writes all of these things after the day of Pentecost. He's recounting what happened on that day at the festival. You know, I, I can only imagine John writing it like, oh man, you should have seen Jesus saying like, oh, anyone who comes to me, 
he remembered Jesus prophesying. Jesus was prophesying, it's not today, but if you believe in me today, when the Holy Spirit comes, you will receive it. John is already filled with the Holy Spirit at the time of his writing. God's word is so fun. Verse 38 should be the highlighted, bold print, italicized, memorized, on your fridge, on your mirror. The scripture that every believer proclaims every day. Pour your spirit out. Jesus, you are the only source of living water. Your Holy Spirit, today I need it. Today I need it. Pour it out. Every day for every believer, pour it out. Father, pour it out. Let it flow. We are thirsty. Pour it out. Does verse 38 say that if you're good Monday through Saturday, then you can come? Right? Verse 38 does not say that some may come. Verse 38 says, anyone who is thirsty may come. No stipulations. If you're thirsty, you can come. Anyone who is thirsty may come and drink living water. Again, this is all before the day of Pentecost. The Spirit has not yet been poured out to fulfill the prophecy. Oh, thank you, Lord. There are four points I believe the Lord has given for us today. And number one, Jesus did not come to break tradition. Jesus came to break religion. There's nothing wrong with tradition so long as our tradition does not become our religion. The definition of religion says that it is a personal set or institutionalized system of religious attitudes. Religion is the service and worship of God. If we begin to worship the service or the system rather than God, we hinder our relationship with with God by putting religion before him. Jesus knew the law God had given to Moses and the ceremonies that were required. It says so in uh, verse 19, John 7, 19. Moses gave you the law, verse 19, but none of you obeys it. See, it's easy for traditions to become our religion when we, when we start focusing on what traditions mean to us rather than why we have them in the first place. We've all seen the signs around Christmas that says, Jesus is the reason for the season, right? It's not about pretty lights and a a man dressed in a red suit. It's about the light who became man that we can receive the gift. But it's not just Christmas. Every Thanksgiving, we should be paying our respects to the nonconformist who said, I don't want religion, I want Jesus. They came to a foreign land not knowing what what, what they were getting themselves into. The missionaries that first started freedom of religion in this country where we know how to pray to God, the Father, instead of to a man in a box called Father. Our traditions can so easily become our religion. To the Jewish people, living water is another name for God. They had many names of God. Living water was just one of them. They're on your handout. Isaiah and Jeremiah both prophesied, speaking from God. God himself, in Jeremiah, is the fountain of living water. And God spoke through Isaiah saying, I will pour out water. I will pour out water. He is the water source. 
I will pour out water to quench your thirst and to irrigate your parched fields. And I will pour out my spirit on your descendants. It's prophecy. Verse three, God is the source of living water. So here we see water and spirit. It's the same pouring out. I will pour out my spirit on your descendants and my blessings on your children. Now, throughout this festival, I told you I wouldn't go too much into the ceremonies. I studied it a lot. And I really wish I had time to go through it. But there was a ceremony each day where the priest was commanded, again, to do this ceremony. The priest would gather water in a vase from the pool of Siloam. I really want to go there. Why the significance of the pool of Siloam? It had a lot of significance. But I'm not going to rabbit trail, I promise. The priest would pour out this vase of water. The water represented God on the people. Every single day, they would do this ceremony. The priests would go, and they would chant Isaiah 12, 3, I believe. Rivers of living water, rivers of living water. And the priests would gather the water out of the pool of Siloam and then take it back to the people and pour it out over them. Do I need to remind you that Jesus is at this festival? So he sees this happening? The water in the vase signified when water gushed out of the rock for Israelites. Jehovah Jireh, the provider. God is the living water. The priests are pouring God out for the people. God provides living water, very sacred. And because this term was so much more than just rain for the people, now Jesus is standing in front of a Jewish crowd claiming that he has the living water. To the Jewish people, that's blasphemy. That's why the crowds were so divided. Look there in uh, verse 40. When the crowds heard him say this, some of them declared, Surely this man is the prophet we've been expecting. Others said, he is the Messiah. Still others said, but he can't be. He came from Galilee. The scriptures clearly state that the Messiah will be born of the royal line in Bethlehem. <laughs> so the crowd was divided about him. Some even wanted to arrest him, but no one laid a hand on him. When the temple guards returned without having arrested Jesus, the leading priests and Pharisees demanded, why didn't you bring him in? We've never heard anyone speak like this. The second point in breaking tradition is for the sake of our passion. It's important to have passion for our purpose. God has given us each an individual purpose for his kingdom. But he has also given a purpose for the church body as a whole. Our mission is to burn with the passion he's given us. The passion for our purpose is what relates us to the Jewish people at the time of this festival. Things weren't that different back then. I mean, aside from like modern technology, transportation, plumbing, etc., Things weren't that different back then. If you look at a typical day in the life of a Jewish person, they were so focused on the task at hand. Raising a family meant hauling water, first things first, get up, go to the well. Hauling water, tilling the fields, going to market, planting seed, hauling water, harvesting crops, hauling water, making bread from scratch, tilling the fields haul, <laughs> over and over. Harvesting crops, making bread. Ever felt like this? Same old, same old. Could you imagine? I'm just thinking of our little girl. Just think, one day all this will be yours. Not necessarily a desirable future. Maybe one day I'll haul water better than anyone else and become king. Maybe I'll bake the best bread 
and everybody will come to me for bread. I'm going to start my own restaurant. I'm going to be an entrepreneur. No. They weren't living for fame. They weren't living for success. They weren't in the lineage to become king or queen. Same old, same old. They were living for the hope of relief. Relief was their only hope. Relief from the oppression. Their promised Messiah offered them safety, offered them freedom, offered them security. They believe that God would see their obedience in all of their traditional, the festivals. They, would, they believe that God would see their obedience in going to these festivals, making sure that they were right with God, reading the Torah, and their obedience would one day free them with the coming Messiah. Their father's land was once his father's land was once his father's land, was once his father. And then they would bring in women to that home to do it all over again. Tradition. Their children would carry on the traditions of the people. The years of oppression were upon them. Are we that different? As a Christian culture, as a Christian culture, do we feel just a little oppressed by the world, by the government? To back then, kings had possessions. Slaves had masters. Romans had freedom. But Jerusalem had hierarchy. The religious leaders were governing the Jewish people. And the religious leaders had made a deal with the Roman government. The leaders would keep the Jewish law. They would keep the people in line. And in return, the Jewish leaders would force the people to pay their taxes. The government made a deal with the people. Are we that different? During Christ's ministry on earth, the government would make deals to keep people happy. And the only hope that these people had was in the relief their Messiah would bring them. See, when we allow traditions to become our religion, we become lukewarm. When we allow traditions to become our religion, we become lukewarm. Lukewarm Christians can't pour out hot water. It's that simple. Just like the fire within us must be hot to spread, living water must stay hot. Boiling water will do one of two things. It will either boil over or evaporate. But it always stays hot. In a pot of boiling water, you see it starting to evaporate. What do you do? You pour a little more in. You pour a little more in. You pour a little more in. And it stays hot. And it starts to boil right back up again. Lukewarm water, what does it do? If it sits there, it eventually gets cold. Same is true with the living water within us. If we boil over, what will God do? If we are boiling over with the Holy Spirit, what does he do? What does his word say that he will do? Replenish his people. Jesus told the Samaritan in, in John chapter 4, verse 13. Anyone who drinks this water, talking about the well water, will soon be thirsty again. But those who drink the water I give will never be thirsty again. It becomes a fresh, bubbling spring within them, giving them eternal life. Fresh, never stagnant. It's a bubbling spring within them. Our third point, our third point, in order to break tradition, we must be willing to be teachable. Pastor Ken begins Wednesday night Bible study this way. 
when he's starting a new Bible study, he'll say, now we're, we're going to read this and pretend you've never read it before. Remove everything that you know about this scripture. Taking away all our preconceived thoughts about what it means to follow Jesus. For the living water to flow and not be stagnant, the fresh bubbling spring, we can't recirculate the same water. We can't recirculate the same routine, praying the same prayers. Living water lives within us. And Jesus says it's flowing. 738, anyone who believes in me may come and drink. Rivers of living water will flow from his heart. It's our encouragement to memorize new scriptures, pray new prayers, give new offerings, sing new songs. Pools of stagnant water become infested with bacteria, unsuitable to drink. The lost people whom Jesus has not yet become the Lord of their lives are thirsty. The lost are thirsty. And they won't survive on unclean water. The living water that we have is exactly that. It's alive. Traditions can lose their significance over time. And as a youth pastor, I can say with confidence that the generation behind us are all thirsty for the signs, wonders, and miracles of God. And we know that there are generations that hear from God, and we know that there are generations that see God's hand. And now more than ever, it's about what is seen. The most common source of entertainment today, social media. Someone will ask you, by the end of today, someone will ask you, did you see that video? Whether it's, name them, YouTube, TikTok, Facebook. Did you see that video on YouTube? Did you see that video on TikTok? Did you see that video? During the Welsh revival in 1904, they would say, did you hear about that Roberts fella? Did you hear about the singing sisters? Did you hear about those five-year-old children that are spreading the gospel? Did you hear them? That was then. This is a new generation. The enemy has now taken ground in our children's curriculum. The enemy has taken ground over our children's teachers. Taken ground on the illustrations in our children's books. What they see is so important. We are raising up a generation who is thirsty for living water. And we must be mindful of the quality of water we are pouring out. New life, new water. We are baptized in a pool, but we are raised out of the pool to walk in newness of life. To speak in newness, to pray in newness, but most importantly, we are to show those who have not yet believed what Jesus can do through our actions. If the joy of our returning Savior can be demonstrated in how we live, unbelievers will want what they see in us. They'll say, whatever it is that you have, I want it. And we get to say, it's Jesus the joy of the Lord. He is alive. Not just something we say on Resurrection Sunday. He is alive. We act out our faith. We pour it out. He'll fill us back up. Pour it out. He'll fill us back up. He is faithful to replenish us as we pour out. I'm going to attempt to close, I promise. Pastor Ken says that if you hear a preacher pe preaching about anything, it's because it's near and dear to his heart. What's near and dear to my heart, something the Lord put on my heart, is four words, no body left behind. Now that's proper grammar, no body left behind. 
We must tell the world of our Savior and how he died that we might be forgiven and receive eternal life. But that's not all he gives us. I believe we must include the joy of his return. The parallel to the oppressed Jewish people at the time in John 7 is no different to the oppression the Christian people are are feeling right now. The last point in breaking tradition is so cliche, so simple. We must be more concerned with God's approval than man's. We must be more concerned with God's approval than man's. Jesus only gave us a few commandments. Love God and love others. We know that he emphasized the the commandments God gave Moses, but the importance of forgiving others comes because he first forgave us. He He taught us not to love money and temporary things, store our treasures up in heaven. I'm not downplaying any of these. But he said that these two are the most important. Matthew twenty-two thirty-seven. 37. You must love the Lord your God with all your heart, all your soul, and all your mind. This is the first and greatest commandment. A second is equally important. Love your neighbor as yourself. The entire law and all the demands of the prophets are based on these two commandments. Man has made up the rest. The Jewish people did it back then, and we're just as guilty of it today. We have made requirements to laws that don't even exist. We need to seek God's approval. He says, love him, love people, forgive others, give to others, seek God's approval over man's. The the Jewish people weren't wrong in their traditions. I want to make that very clear. I'm not diminishing their traditions. We're not wrong in our traditions. That's not the point here today. The point is traditions are not all we have. Jesus came to disrupt religion so that we keep the significance in the traditions that we have. The Jewish people were so conditioned to their traditions because it's all they had. Their obedience to the law. It's not all we have. Jesus says the law has now been accomplished. Matthew 5, 17. Don't misunderstand why I have come. I did not come to abolish the law of Moses or the writings of the prophets. No, I came to accomplish their purpose. So why did I open with Zechariah? That's a prophecy that has not yet been fulfilled, right? Jesus says he came to accomplish the purpose of the prophets. His is the name that the entire world will one day worship. Uh, But here's why I opened with Zechariah. At the festival of shelters Jesus attended in John chapter 7, Zechariah 14 was traditionally recited. As the people were reciting by memory, hence the tradition, Zechariah 14, 8 through 9, on that day, this is what they're reciting. Get a picture. Thousands of people are reciting. On that day, life-giving waters will flow out from Jerusalem, flowing continuously. The people are, are saying this. And the Lord will be king over all the earth. Jesus is there. While they're reciting the scripture, on that day, there will be one Lord. His name alone will be worshipped. Their prayer was for relief. One day will no longer suffer. One day when your living water, oh God, will flow, will no longer suffer. Jesus, showing compassion, was offering relief right then. No more waiting. John 7, 37 says, anyone who is thirsty may come to, this is what he's saying to the people that are reciting Zechariah 14 out of tradition. I'm right here. 
who you're talking about to come and save you. Right here. Anyone who believes in me may come and drink. For the scriptures declare. What scriptures? The scripture you're reciting right now. It's part of the verse. It's part of what John wrote. Reciting. For the scriptures declare. They were declaring it right in front of Jesus. For the scriptures declare, John 7, 38, rivers of living water will flow from his heart. Some that day believed that their Messiah had indeed come. Some believed that their relief had finally come to those who received his truth on that day. Verse 40 says, when the crowds heard him say this, some of them declared, surely this is the prophet we've been expecting. Others said, he is the Messiah. If I can ask the worship team to come back up to the altar, please. Our challenge today is to ask ourselves, what message are we proclaiming directly in the face of Jesus? The people at the festival were saying, on that day, the Lord alone will be worshipped. While Jesus stood there and implied, that day is now. The tradition of reciting the scripture had a lot of meaning. We're talking about hundreds of years. They had been doing this over and over. They knew the significance of the tradition. But they had never done it right in front of the one who came to save them. Some accepted that Jesus was indeed the one they had been expecting, but others went on about the but others went on about the tradition of the festival. While Jesus was standing right in front of them, they went on with the festival. Just as Jesus was at that traditional festival, his Holy Spirit is here today. Instead of going through the motions of tradition, we claim his presence right now, right here. Some of us will go out and make disciples. Some of us will go home, put a check next to the box, like Tim Bennett says, I'm a Christian, went to church today. The word of God says that faith without works is dead. The opposite of living water that lives within us. The purpose of the revival is for it to renew our devotion and commitment to the call. These waters will flow. They will continue to flow by the Holy Spirit. I believe that. Our responsibility is to move with the Spirit wherever we are. As we pour out what God has so freely given to us, He will replenish us as we pray right now. The altar is open. Father, we thank you for meeting us right here, right now, as we are. No matter what we came in, Father, we know that we're not leaving with it because you have made us anew. You have refreshed our minds. You have renewed our strength. And we thank you that we can walk in your peace, with your comfort, by the Holy Spirit you have given to us. Thank you for ministering through your word and through your presence today. In Jesus' name, thank you.